think most of you know me. I'm Jamie Monson. I'm the director of the African Studies Center. And it's really a wonderful, wonderful privilege and kind of a homecoming for me to welcome my dear friend and brother, Sharif Keita, to Michigan State University. Thank you. Sharif was at Carleton College when I first started teaching there in 1991, fresh out of graduate school. Um, and from then on, really, we've had a long and very wonderful connection, uh, both at the family level and at the professional level. And um, I'll just share one quick story, because we actually are both storytellers. That's part of what brings <laughs> us together. Um, I was asked in my early years as a young faculty member to speak to a big meeting of donors and the president of the college and deans about something I had learned from another person at the college, because liberal arts colleges are really about cross-disciplinary engagement. And so I told a story about what I learned from Sharif. Because I used to invite him to come speak in my African history classes about the praise poem and the, the, um, the epic or the story of Sunjata, the founder of the Mali Empire. And what I learned from Sharif was that all those poems that we'd read about in books were actually musical. They'd been sung. And every time Sharif came to my class, he would play video and play recordings of griots singing the epic of Sunjata. But it took a while for that to sink in. You know, as a person trained in history, I was just right out of the archive. But finally, I had this epiphany, like, oh my god, history is music, and history is poetry, and now history is film. And I think I'm once again following in your footsteps in my very first film, still almost finished. But it's wonderful to, to have you here. I know you've been here once before. I know you have friends here. Yes. But there are lots of new friends for yes. you to meet. Yes. And we hope we're mm. uh, returning to a friendship that will continue. So mm. you're warmly welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you all. Thank you, Jamie, for this invitation. Uh, the first time I was here was uh, 21 years ago. <laughs> Yes, and I don't remember anything from that day, from that time. Well, it was uh, uh, the time when uh, Michigan State uh, decided to give an honorary doctorate to Mali's president at that time, President Alpha Omar Konare, uh, a well-known historian, and his wife, uh, Dr. Adam Bakunare, also a well-known historian, an amazing couple. I mean, uh, both doctors, both uh, humanists and uh, wonderful people. So Michigan State uh, uh, had the idea of giving them an honorary doctorate. And from the very beginning of the process, they, they consulted with me and I facilitated some stuff. And then when it was approved that they were going to get the honorary doctorate, so I was invited to come uh, for the commencement. Uh, ceremony. So that was 21 years ago, and at, at this, uh, we took also the same op the opportunity to also do a symposium in their honor. Uh, the Monday Studies Association, Mansa. That's it. These are the acronyms. Uh, uh, some of the members were on this campus, so they invited a number of us uh, to do a symposium in the honor of the Conar of the, of the Conares during their visit. So I was so busy, I didn't really see the campus. Okay, mm -hmm. so uh, you know, it's almost like a new experience for me. So again, I thank uh, Jamie and the African Studies Program uh, for giving me a chance to meet old friends, uh, people who uh, who's, uh, who have uh, pushed me along the way. They may not be aware of it, but, uh, you know, I remember, uh, uh, you know, uh, my conversation with them about South Africa, uh, a new territory I was branching into, uh, David, uh, 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 Dean, a doyen here, who has worked in the area that I'll be speaking about today, and Stephen, we've met a number of times in Mali, and uh, there are others too, so uh, John starts, I understand he retired, you see, but, uh, so these are, these are my connections to, to, uh, to to Michigan State, and for, for Jamie to come here and be at this center, uh, it, was, it was meant to be. So as you say, it's something coming full circle. Uh, because, I mean, all this research really uh, started thanks to Jamie. I mean, I must say that the story that Jamie just started with, inviting me into her classes uh, at St. Olaf, both St. Olaf and Carlton, uh, in history, uh, to talk about the oral tradition, to talk about the oral epic, uh, to talk about the, the practitioners, the wordsmith, you see, uh, is literally what, uh, you know, uh, led Jamie to ask me very generously in 1999 
to co-lead a program with her, an off-campus program to South Africa for St. Olaf College. Uh, and the title of it was Poetry, Performance, and the Politics of Identity in South Africa. So that's why the theme we chose, because Jamie wanted to include me, you know, uh, coming from the uh, notion that history is performance. History is music. History is something that is lived, you see. Uh, it's not something remote there, you see. The past is always here to shape. In fact, the notion of praise singing, praise singing through the song is people's identity, their status that is being built through the song, you see. So, so Jamie invited me uh, 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 as a francophone person uh, had nothing to do with Southern Africa per se uh, to, to, to co-lead that program with her. I mean, to tell you the truth, Jamie, you've changed my life, I tell you. I mean, that program, oh man, 21 years, my life has not been the same. I mean, coming from the Francophone field to literally spending uh, almost 24 hours now working on Southern Africa and producing what I produce. So it's thanks to you. So again, it shows also how off-campus studies is not only important for students, it's also important for faculty development. Because I did not suspect that my life was going to take this turn, you see what I mean? So it, it, it gave me a platform that I'm still thankful for and that I'm still continuing to develop, you know, this relationship with Southern Africa. Because uh, from South Africa now I'm moving into Mozambique, you know? So things are really, you know, and following the same thread of the story, but which is, strangely enough, starts in Northfield, Minnesota. That, you see, that's the part that, in fact, people tell me in South Africa, I say, you know, the work you're doing is more than academic research, they say, it's ancest ancestral possession. The ancestors possess you during that trip in South Africa. That's why you're doing what you're doing. But again, it goes back to the, 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 the help, the, 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 the connection with Jamie. Because back home, we have the notion of sababu. There is a term that is very important in Monday worldview. It says sababu. Sababu comes from Arabic, asbab. Asbab means a cause, a cause of something. There is this belief that, and they use this uh, very figurative way of explaining it. They say, if you're walking, you're walking, and suddenly uh, a little piece of rock, you stumble upon it, and then you fall. But when you fall, your hand stretches and falls on gold. They say, okay, now, which place you should thank? Should you thank the place where your hand took the gold, or should you thank the, the rock that made you stumble? So that's the notion of sababu. That's how we explain it. So Jamie has been the sababu for what I'm going to be telling you today. And uh, again, you know, because so many connections appeared, you know, that were, you know, totally unexpected. Anyway, so that's why I'm going to take you from Northfield to the land of the Zulus on the footsteps of a rebel missionary. My purpose today is to introduce you to two individuals who played a seminal but unheralded role in the making of democratic South Africa. They are missionaries, Reverend William Cullen Wilcox, 1850 to 1928, and his wife, Ida Bell Wilcox, 1858 to 1940. So I wanna begin by showing the first clip. So maybe, uh, can we darken this a little bit so that at least we can take advantage of the video? I'm gonna show you clips of my film. The film is titled Cemetery Stories, a rebel missionary in South Africa. So I'll show uh, uh, four clips of it as I talk. So, uh, yeah, I think, and if we turn off the light, then I think that, uh, that will make it visible. So let me, okay, very good, okay, very good. So I'll just play uh, a small clip here to introductory clip, okay. Yeah. <laughs> 
Gulf of Minnesota. These people are reenacting the defeat of the notorious Jesse James gang. The gang tried to rob the town's bank in 1876. Thus, over a hundred years ago, during the time of the American cowboy, horse-drawn carts and Christian missionaries fanning out all over the world. These are the residents of Cornfields and Tamalifide in KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, celebrating their victory over the apartheid government, a government which tried for more than 80 years to remove them from the land of their ancestors. They are dancing in a tradition that goes back hundreds of years before European contact, before colonization. These are two very different towns with very different cultures, in distant countries on faraway continents. All of these people have a very strong and deep connection that goes back well over 100 years. And this connection rests with two individuals, William Cullen and Ida Bell Wilcox, two missionaries who landed in Natal in 1881. <laughs> and if the connection established by William and Ida Bell Wilcox has been hidden for ages under the rubbles of history. Today, more than a hundred years later, it is coming back to life through me. I am Sharif Keita, a professor of French and Francophone literatures at Carlton College right here in Northfield. A proverb from my native country of Mali in West Africa says that when the dance floor becomes crowded with dancers, often the person who was first to answer the call to dance is forgotten. This was the case of William and Ida Bell Wilcox, forgotten until today. He was a 19th century American missionary, one of the first to answer the call for a free South Africa. He was a man who took upon himself a tremendous personal cost to educate and send for education in the United States some of the founding leaders of the African National Congress, today known as the ANC. He went around the colony of Natal, telling the Zulus not to pay taxes to a government that did not give them representation. That was the beginning of the famous Bambata Rebellion, brutally repressed by the colonial government in 1906. He built with his own money and his own hands towns and entire communities for black Africans who were displaced and made landless in their own country. Ultimately, after 40 years of missionary work, William Cullen Wilcox was declared a public enemy by the colonial establishment and driven out of South Africa in 1918. He left with little more than the shirt on his back and lucky to leave with even that. Okay, so yeah, let's, oh, let's, let, okay, let me stop. It just plays automatically. Okay, so, uh, okay, so for the next, if I want to set up the next, uh, clip that's going to be for later oh good okay i see it okay all right so for me william and adabel wilcox are two of the unsung prophets of south africa's multiracial democracy by their unwavering commitment to civil rights for black south africans from the moment they arrived in inanda the colony of natal in south africa in 1881 as missionaries of the american board of commissioners for foreign missions abcfm to the fateful years of 1917 and 1918, when they were forced out of South Africa by a coalition of Natal colonists and the British administration. William and Ida Bell Wilcox are the adoptive American parents of the South African liberation pioneer and hero, Reverend Do Dr. John Langalibalele Dube, known as the South African Bugatti Washington. John is the co-founder, was the co-founder of the Otlangi Institute, an imitation of the Tuskegee Institute, with his wife, Nukutelam Dima Dube, in 1900. He was also the founder of the Ilanga newspaper, the first English Zulu newspaper uh, in 1903, and the co-founder and first president general of the South African Native National Congress, later known as the ANC, in 1912. John Dube's rise to national and international prominence owes as much to the unwavering friendship and mentoring of missionaries William and Ida Bell Wilcox as to the parenting of his own parents. Reverend James Dube, a Zulu ordained pastor, in fact the first ordained Zulu pastor of the American Zulu mission, and his wife Elizabeth Shangazi. Reverend Wilcox and his wife Adabel were missionaries who were not satisfied to just preach against the injustice they saw all around them 
in colonial South Africa, or even on a mission station, the injustice they saw there. They were willing to go down into the trenches to fight on the side of the oppressed masses. In fact, up until recently, in both the official circles of the ANC, and the academic circles also, little was known about Reverend William Wil Colin Wilcox. One would often read in the short biographical notices published about John Dubey that he accompanied a certain missionary, Wilcox, to America. That is often all that was mentioned. The stories of how John Dubey, this liberator figure, reached America has taken some interesting uh, uh, shapes in the popular imagination. One captivating story is from somebody who probably, you probably know, is the Zulu shaman Credo Mutua. Who knows Credo Mutua? He was a very well-known Zulu shaman. That's right, exactly, okay. So uh, he, he say, he, the story says that, uh, that John Dubey went to America as a stowaway on a boat and was not discovered un until the boat reached the high seas. And I quote uh, uh, Credo Mutua. He would have died of thirst or hunger had not a couple of sailors discovered him in the hold. They frog marched him more, than, more dead than alive to the captain's cabin. The captain at first did not know what to do with John Dubey. Should he clap him down in irons or throw him overboard? Finally, it was decided that the young Zulu could be useful aboard the ship and that he would work for his passage to the US as a stoker feeding shovels of coals to the roaring and, roaring and ever hungry furnaces of the great vessel. And then he quotes the captain and said, you are as ugly and black as the very devil, my boy, said the captain to John Dubey, and by the Virgin Mary, you're gonna work like him, end of quote. So this is the story of how John Dubey arrived in America. This was in popular culture, you see, and Credo Mutua you know, wrote that in his book. So let me show then the second clip here. Okay. So, all right. Okay. As I researched John Dubey's life, I wanted to know how he got to the United States. And later, who were the missionaries who helped him get here in the late 19th century? All these questions led me to Reverend William Wilcox and his wife, Ida Ben and to the surprising discovery that Ida Bell was a native of Northfield. This was to be the first of several revelations and mysterious connections that would come my way over the next eight years. I had made up my mind. 90 years after Wilcox's death, I decided that I was going to reclaim this amazing man from the purgatory of history and bring him into the pantheon of the first South African liberation heroes. People who had opened paths in the wilderness with their bare hands. People who had a vision of the great liberation day when everything was still gray. People who jumped to their feet once the drums of war beat their first notes. I looked for William Wilcox's descendants and found an 89-year-old grandson on the other side of the country. Hello, uh, John. How are you? Very good. So you just got in there. Eh? Okay, we are just downstairs. Uh, I'm here with my friends, uh, you know, uh, at the reception. After corresponding with him for a couple of years, two generations of the family have arrived in Northfield to meet with me. Jackson Wilcox's daughter, Deborah, from Alaska. The Reverend himself came from Fresno, California. Good to see you, good to see you. Oh, finally, Ready? all these years, you know, we've been speaking on the phone. John, hey. His son, John, from North Dakota. Yes, Mrs. Wilcox. Yes, Hello, how are nice you? Oh, wonderful. Nice so, welcome to Northfield. Yeah. We sat down to talk about our unlikely connection and about my discoveries about the family's history, both in the United States and South Africa. Because you went to the University of Redland, of the Redlands. That's why I went to college. Yeah. That's right, because that's how I, I, I connected with you. Was it? Yes, because you see, I went to Ida Bell's obituary. Because I looked for family all over the place. And I didn't see any welcomes, any clear, I mean, clear around you. Decided, I said, well, let me go to the obituary of Ida Bell, who died much later, mm -hmm. and see who was alive, who was the survivors. 
And then he came across your name as uh, being at the University of the Rennes. Let me contact the university and see if they have, you know, if they are in touch with you. Okay, I know you won't give me his contact, but can I send him a message to you? But they say, oh, we'll be happy. Two weeks later, I got a letter from you, you see, mm -hmm. uh, which was such a nice surprise because that was my first contact with anybody in the family. Found a copy of Map and African Jungle on the internet. Really? Yeah. Interesting. yeah, there were actually two of them, and I should have bought both of them. Because when I went back to buy the second one, of course, it was gone. It's a great book. When Carl Wilcox was writing Man from the African Jungle, he, had, he, he used to send my father a chapter at a time. And I remember my father reading it. But, you know, I was a little kid. That was... <laughs> And I didn't pay attention to it. That's right. It's yeah. not just a book about a missionary. No. It's a, a book about a man who's very adventurous right. and he's fearless to go forward and do whatever he needs to do in his quest. Right. And there are stories in there that I think anybody out there would love to hear. Of course, yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Okay. <clears throat> in fact, this book. Uh, uh, written, uh, published in 1926, two years before Wilcox died, was about his, uh, his uh, story in Mozambique. Uh, for the American Zulu mission, he started a mission station there between 1883 and 1886. And it was quite an interesting experiment. So uh, that's why my research is going into Mozambique now, because I reconnected with the descendants of his first convert there. And a uh, first convert who later became one of the fathers of the Mozambican Revolution. So that's also a little interesting. So that's where my, my story is, my work is heading now, anyway. So in the context of so much ignorance about the father of the liberation movement, uh, John Dube, it's easy to understand why the question of who missionary Wilcox was and what he did during his 38 years in Natal was rarely asked and therefore never substantially answered. Yet knowing this historic figure, is crucial for a rewriting of South Africa's liberation history because he played at such an early time a truly revolutionary role, a notion usually not associated with missionaries. I would say that Wilcox was a renegade missionary and a precursor of liberation theology. In the late 1890s, this is how he spelled out what, in his view, was the role of the missionary, a quote. The missionary cannot help giving the native an idea of his worth when he teaches the gospel of Christ. There is nothing in the whole Bible to show the superiority in a white skin or that a man born with kinky hair and a dark complexion is not just as good as any other man. When to this idea of worth, which means racial equality, is added an education which is above the simple requirements of religious belief, the man emerges, realizing his worth and hating the white man who would kick him off the sidewalk. And as he and his kind become more enlightened, and as their numbers continue to increase more rapidly than the whites, they will not always submit to taxation without representation. That echoes, as echoes, you know. They are not always going to be excluded from every place of honor and responsibility, end of quote. These prophetic words encapsulate the motivations which led William and Adabel Wilcox to do in 1887 what other missionaries had refused to do. They accepted a desperate Zulu mother's plea to take her young 16-year-old son to America so that he could get an education he could not get in Natal. Wilcox retells the story of the way the young Dubé was entrusted to him. I quote, and he speaks in the third person about himself, he says. About 25 years ago, as one of the American missionaries was preparing to return to his native land, a Zulu mother came to him with a chubby-faced boy of 16. And putting 30 sovereigns of gold in his hand, she said, I want to give this boy to you. His own father is dead, but he left this money for the education of his son and I want you to be his father and take him to America. Where, he says, he can get all the education white boys get. It is not possible for him to get it here. The missionary hesitated to assume the responsibility as he knew the danger. 
all the missionaries had, were strongly opposed to it. But he could not refuse that pleading mother, the widow of one of our most faithful Zulu ministers, end of quote. Reverend Wilcox and Ida Bell honored this responsibility to the fullest and at a great cost to themselves and to their family. In fact, at the time John's mother was asking them to take her son to America, they did not, they were wondering how they were going to feed themselves once back home in the US. However, Wilcox saw an opportunity to take his revenge, not only on the missionaries who were terminating him because of their difficult relationship, but also on the colonial system by training a young man who would become a thorn in his side. If the Wilcoxes had done nothing else but to raise and guide one of Africa's most talented young leaders in time of great need, it would have been justification enough for their role to be recognized and celebrated after decades of struggle against a evil system which started in the British colonialism and ended with the abolition of apartheid in the early 90s. However, the contribution of the Wilcoxes did to South Africa's liberation history does not stop there with the decision to bring John Dubey to the US in 1887. They were themselves at the forefront of a fight with both the missionary orthodoxy and with the colonial establishment. The common story is one of the proverbial missionary who invited Africans to close their eyes and pray, thus allowing other Europeans to take their land. In every way, the story of the Wilcoxes is a counterpoint to this, to this story. And like most missionaries who are determined to only uh, indoctrinate Africans spiritually and culturally, the Wilcoxes saw economic empowerment as the first step in achieving a true Christian life. Wilcox was revolted by the way in which the colonial state promoted land grabbing and was driving black people from the rural areas and into the mines and to the cities where they often fell prey to vice and moral corruption. He took issue with the official American Zulu mission's position on the land question, which is something that is being hotly debated today in South Africa, which he likened to a complicity with the colonial administration to exploit people of color. He said, I quote, I could not approve of the action of the mission in handing over the lands of the native as they did to the government against their protest. And therefore I asked to be given work where I would be free from the embarrassment of this land question." Uh, end of quote. His vocal opposition and protests were not at all appreciated by his employers, the American board, leading to a final separation around 1909. One black leader wrote to Ilanga Lasse Natal. Ilanga Lasse Natal is a newspaper that John and Nukutela started in 1903. That is published to this day, in fact. To express his sadness in the following terms, I quote, Mr. Wilcox is admired for his undying love for the people and his dedication to serving the Lord. He does not discriminate against anyone. He can stand for his beliefs, even if they do not agree with that of other whites. He is a good man because during the time of the hard tax, another name for the Bambata Rebellion, he supported black people by saying that they should not pay taxes. Mr. Wilcox is well respected and we need more people like him who are not afraid to stand up on their own and argue for what they believe. Perhaps most people like him because he's the kind of man who acknowledges his mistakes and apologizes to black people, something that most whites would not do." End of quote. Now that Wilcox was finally free from the, his association with the American board in 1909, the time was ripe for him to resolutely implement his belief in independent missions, something he had tried in Mozambique, which you know, he did not succeed fully because the American board closed that mission and was later taken by the Methodist church. Anyway, so the type that would be self-sustaining, self-determining, and that would not rely on handouts from church organizations in America. He believed that the first step was to encourage a spirit of industry among the Zulus. He wrote, I quote, suppose the 700,000 Zulus of Natal were thrifty, intelligent agriculturalists with small holdings, good houses, fenced fields, well cultivated and full trees as may be found in most states of America, who cannot see 
how vastly greater would be the wealth of this country. There is a mine in Zulu muscles richer than any that have been discovered in the rand or that will be discovered, end of quote. In 1910, it returned to the United States, from the United States, with the seed money to start what will be known as the Zulu Industrial Improvement Company, a shell holding company whose aim was to give the Christian community, known as the Amakolwa in Zulu, the economic power to withstand the land grabbing movement of the colonists and of the administration. Many in Natal, among the blacks, believed in his dream and greeted his return to Natal with enthusiasm in Ilanga Lasse Natal. And I quote, with much pleasure, we announce the coming back to Natal of that veteran missionary, Reverend William C. Wilcox, who for many years worked for the betterment of the natives. Previous to him leaving Natal, he had, he had adopted the idea of a cooperative industrial scheme. In South Africa, scheme means business plan, okay? And in the face of much discouragement, he has worked strenuously and hopefully for giving due effect to the scheme. The plan is arranged so f as to fit, it with current, to fit in with current ideas of commercial enterprise. And we are of the opinion that with anything like fair opportunity, the reverend gentleman will make it successful. The gospel of work does not appeal to everybody. And some are satisfied to go halfway, but Reverend Wilcox is a whole way man and is therefore likely to make the results just what are intended." End of quote. Indeed, this company, the, the Zulu Industrial Improvement Company, with its 300 black shareholders, was able to provide land to many desperate families in the Natal Midlands. And it is this success, according to Wilcox, that raised a serious alarm among white colonists and led to led eventually to the passing of the terrible 1913 Natives Land Act. Wilcox wrote in 1912 in Ilanga Lasse Natal, he wrote this, I quote, we had more applicants than we had land, and I challenged missionaries and colonists to show me a more industrious and honest class of natives than the 300 who entered the scheme and took holdings. We bought one farm and paid for it entirely, then we bought another farm and paid for that, and still more land was needed, was required. Our success was too great and apparent. White people were alarmed. When we bought the third farm, an outcry was raised. And he says this, the white people saying, why these kafirs were actually buying a piece of land a white man could live on? And he says, that could not be tolerated, that could not be allowed in this free country of ours, end of quote. The passionate advocacy of Reverend William Wilcox, commonly known by his Zulu name, Mbuya Batwa. Mbuya Batwa refers to a plant that can grow under the most hostile conditions. That's what the Zulu have given, the name they had given, Mbuya Batwa. So his advocacy on behalf of the blacks of Natal led him to found, in 1911, two communities in Natal today known as Cornfields and Timberlithley in the escort area, about 100 kilometers from Peter Marysburg. To the great displeasure of the local white farmers who managed with the complicity of the administration and, uh, and the many restrictions they imposed through the Native Land Act of 1913 to drive the Zulu Industrial Improvement Company into bankruptcy. Wilcox's concern for black economic empowerment were in perfect harmony with those of the South African Native National Congress, the party of his Ifos protégé. So much so that one of the first protest actions of the newly created group was a petition to the members of parliament of Britain on behalf of Wilcox and the, the member and the Zulu Industrial Improvement Company. The petition says, I read, I quote, about nine months ago, Application was made on behalf of 400 natives by Mr. Wilcox of the William Division in Natal to purchase a farm between two native holdings. The Governor General's permission was not granted and the farm has now passed on into the hands of a white man. So that was part of the petition that they put to the government. 
end of quote. This extract of the ANC petition gives us an idea of the devious techniques used by the white administration to derail and drive out of existence a company that proved that, with equal chances, the Amakolwa, the Christian community, had every way of building a solid economic base for itself. By 1914, the Zulu Industrial Company, Industrial Improvement Company, was crumbling under its debts and the penalties it incurred, incurred for violating rules that prohibited joint ventures and land transactions between races. That was prohibited. Broke and destitute William and Adabel Wilcox were treated as pariahs by other whites, even the missionaries, and driven out of South Africa in 1917. Uh, for their fight for equal rights to land ownership for all in South Africa. And he wrote in Ilanga, I quote, why should the natives not be free to buy land where they want to in the land of their birth, the same as anybody else, especially as Indians and other foreigners do, end of quote. In fact, it, by 1917, uh, they were so poor that, and so broke that they didn't have enough money for the two of them to pay for their boat fare to come back to the United States. It's the Inanda community, the, the native Christian community, that collected money, that collected money to send him first because the wife had to stay behind because they didn't have enough money. And the way they hit the level of their destitution was that there was a law uh, during First World War of women not traveling on boats going through war zones. So they used that argument to cover, to literally save their face, that the wife had to stay behind to teach so she could have some money, actually, to have some money to pay for herself almost one year later, when the war ended, because they were so poor. So they sent him. And it's just a, a, a moving story how they praised him, how Imbongis jumped to their feet and praised him with praise for him that you were like a shield to us that protected us. I mean, I mean, I would like to retrieve that poem somewhere, you know, if I could find that letter. So anyway, that's one of the refers to in Bongi. So although Wilcox was defeated by the white colonial order, the seeds he planted did not die after his departure from South Africa. The twin communities of Cornfields and Timbalitli in the Natal Midlands resisted what became known as forced removals under apartheid 30 years after Wilcox's departure. They were called informal settlement because the white people never reconciled to the idea that these communities, these two towns have to be there. They had to be removed, forcibly removed, but they couldn't. These areas desi desi designated as black spots, they were called. Areas from which black people had to be forcibly removed so as to create homogeneous areas for white farming and living across South Africa. So how did these communities, these two communities resist when others were so easily removed and relocated to an area called Tabam Hlope? They created a township there where most people, uh, you know, who were removed. How did they resist? They resisted with the, th thanks to the title deeds that the Zulu Industrial Improvement Company had provided them. Not only land, but also title deed. Making it impossible for anyone, British colonial administration and later apartheid government to challenge their right to stay on their land, the land of the ancestors that the ancestors had bought. I'm going to show you the third clip now. Okay. The format here is a bit different. Uh, let's see, okay, yeah, okay, all right, okay, okay, good. So I've taken the family, the descendants of the Wilcox City of South Africa. Yes. When I came down here to meet the elders of Cornfields and the Malifi, Simon Kuru took me to this charming man, Mr. Mabazo, whose grandfather had been one of the first to respond to Wilcox's invitation to join his new settlement under the auspices of the Pasadena Baptist Mission. From the very moment the white colonists saw that Wilcox was selling plots of land to blacks at prices they could afford, they got alarmed and colluded with the Natal government to ruin his successful Zulu Industrial Improvement Company and drive Wilcox to bankruptcy and destitution. Mango, Baona, 
It is said that after the ruin of his company, no white person wanted to employ Wilcox again, not even the other missionaries, because he had dared to side with the blacks. But Roman was the first mayor, the man whose name is on your paper. Yeah. Roman he was the first mayor of Escort. First uh, mayor of Escort. He was a lawyer. No. He was a lawyer, that's right. Yeah, he was a lawyer. That's right. He was the one man that was helping people too. Oh, really? He was a good man? Yeah. Here in Wilcox, we're working together. Yeah. He never says uh, cotton, but he used to say his name on the, on the, on the title bit. Oh, the title bit is yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, he, he called it like that. Oh, okay. He called it like that. He called it like that. Because he's called his own title bit. Really? Yeah. Yes. Look, do you have it far? Do you have it somewhere where you show it? Yeah, it's yeah, 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 yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I could see how proud Mr. Mabazo was to show me his title deed, the precious paper that saved his family and many others from forced removal by the apartheid regime. I was struck to see Wilcox's name on it. One irony became apparent to me. Just as Wilcox's written document had enabled these communities to keep their land for posterity, the elders also in return had given Wilcox immortality through their oral memory. love doing things together. What could give them more pleasure and pride than to celebrate their common founder? Okay, all right. So let me, okay, now I want to close, ah, yeah, I'll close it, okay. Right here. Very good, okay, all right. Thus, after 83 years of harassment by the white farmers, in fact, this, if you see that this part, the name of uh, the region, uh, there is a town called Winan. Winan in, in Afrikaans means tears. That's when the uh, 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 trekkers, when they, in the trek, they settle in that area. And that's unfortunately the area that Wilcox chose to settle black communities. So you can imagine the hostility of the African, the Boer farmers to this day, you see. So anyway, so after 38 years, 80, 83 years of harassment by the white farmers, Vindication came finally in 1994 for both the citizens of these marginalized communities and for Wilcox himself, when the court allowed them to reclaim under the new democratic order the lands that were taken away from them. Because over the years, the whites were taking more and more lands from them. So Wil William Wilcox died in 1928 in California, a man who was financially destitute but who had the great personal satisfaction of knowing that he had done the right thing. He had planted many seeds and left a legacy of courage and commitment among the black population of Natal. Historian Paul Lahos said that in order to find the origins of Zulu economic nationalism, one has to start with William Wilcox's Zulu Industrial Improvement Company. And one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Daryl Balia in, in religion at Northwest University, said that Wilcox is the American Colenso. Bishop Colenso you know, was this famous you know, uh, uh, Anglican bishop who was excommunicated also because of his, his involvement. So this uh, friend of mine says that Wilcox is the American Colenso, you see. So uh, when the news came of his death in 1928, Josiah Mapumulo was one of the most radical intellectuals of 
of the Natal colony wrote this moving tribute in Ilanga Lassi Natal. I quote, I was deeply saddened to hear, to read of the demise of Reverend Wilcox from your beloved newspaper. The pastor used to be my teacher. Okay. Ah, okay. Oh, oh, oh come on. My hand, okay. Ah, okay. And he's the one who encouraged John Duby. Mafukuzela, that's also the nickname of uh, John Dube Mafukuzela, okay, to go overseas with him. He, I was in the same class with John Dube, who is now famous among our people. He was a very courageous man, who was not afraid to criticize other pastors if they did not act, if they were not acting in the interest of the people. That is why these days, in 1928, we need people like Reverend Wilcox, who will stand up for the truth. End of quote. Such was the life of a brave missionary who dared to preach that in colonial South Africa, fighting for economic independence and justice was the first prerequisite for building a true and strong Christian community. Not only did he preach it, he practiced it to a great cost to himself and his family. Viewed as he was, as a public enemy by the state and a renegade and failed missionary by a missionary orthodoxy. Vindication came for Wilcox in November 2009 when the South African government sent a delegation to Los Angeles for the purpose of honoring the early sacrifices of this couple for the cause of democracy. So let me play the last clip here, which is the end of the film. Okay. Light here. to the bestowing of this honor to Reverend William Cullen Wilcox, the award of the Order of the Companions of the O.R. Tambo City, His Excellency the President of the Republic of South Africa, President J.G. Zuma, intends to honor posthumously the Reverend William Cullen Wilcox and Mrs. Ada Bell Wilcox with the Order of the Grand Companions of O.R. Tambo City. This is in recognition of their outstanding contribution to human rights and injustice in South Africa, especially the province of Kosovo Natal. The award ceremony will be held on the 11th of December 2009 at the Presidential Guest House in Pretoria, South Africa. The President would be pleased if you could accept the award on their behalf, as well as grace the occasion with your presence and further details are in, in, indicated where you will go. gentlemen, further cements the relationship between the people of America and the people of South Africa. impact on early liberation movement goes beyond South Africa and stretches into the neighboring country of Mozambique. In the early 20th century, between 1883 and 1886, Wilcox was sent to Mozambique to open a mission in Inyambane. There he had made, he made his first convert, a man by the name of Tizora Navesi. It is at this mission that Wilcox began preaching about self-help and independence. And later, after the mission was abandoned by the American board and taken over by the Methodist Church, 
Tezora Navese became the first native pastor to be ordained by the Methodist Church in Mozambique. From that position, Tezora started his advocacy for native rights in colonial Mozambique and among the Mozambican workers in the mines of South Africa. So how did I get into this research? Let me, let me read a little piece of uh, uh, correspondence. Just recently, the Wilcox family sent me, they went through some papers, and they sent me this note, which was John Dubé's letter to Mrs. Wilcox. In 1928, when Wilcox died, she wrote to her adopted mother this letter. And Wilcox, John had visited them in 1926. He had come to a conference in New York. And up to then, he had never been to the West Coast. But he crossed the country to go visit them in 1926 in California, in the Los Angeles area. So, and then two years later, his adoptive father dies. So he writes this letter from Inanda, Oklange, Phoenix, Natal, South Africa, April 9th, 1928. Dear Mrs. Wilcox, it is just about a year ago that I was with you both at your home in Los Angeles and hardly expected that Mr. Wilcox would pass this life before the years ended. Mr. Stoiber sent me a cutting from a, a paper telling of his death, and Miss Phelps told me also, the Zulus have lost an old and true friend. It was among his last works on earth to work for the tractor for a school. He's gone, but many will remember him for his works. He was a man faithful to his conviction, even if he had to stand alone and suffer poverty and ridicule. I sympathize with you in, the, in your loneliness. I can imagine how you sit alone in that house where you are accustomed to sit and converse with him. But there is a friend that is near, Jesus Christ. We all are getting old and will soon pass hence. Kind regards to your children. God bless you. Yours truly, John L. Dubé. I just received this letter a few months ago from the family. Corroborating really the, the, the ridicule that they suffered when they came back to, 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 to the US, they were, even their families were ashamed of them. They died like paupers. And in fact, he used to do odd jobs, you know, to be able to, to, to survive. So the, 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 the family was so ashamed of them that when I found the old man, his, grand, his grandson, the grandson told me that his, fa his parents, his mother and father, when he decided that he wanted to go into the ministry, that his parents would tell them, why do you want to go into the ministry? You're going to die, like, you don't be like your grandfather, you go die like a pauper, okay? So then when I talked to his son, his own son, okay, it was like family therapy, so you know. So when I talked to his son, his son told me that because he was a, a young, hyperactive young man, he would jump from things to things, that his father, the, the, the grandson of Reverend Wilcox would tell him, and his mother would tell him, you are just like your great-grandfather. You start things and you don't finish them. So when I heard this story about the family, that's why I said that I had to do a film on this family, because I realized that this family is sitting on pain, okay? And that I know what happened, what grew out of what they did. But they had no idea. Even, even uh, Reverend Wilcox's own son wrote a book. That's where I learned that Mrs. Wilcox was from Northfield because uh, their son wrote a book called Proud Endeavor. And then one night I was reading this book at 2 a.m. Okay? And then I was already so excited about John Dubé, John Dubé's connection to America. Okay, and I was starting to, you know, to, to do research on him. Then at 2 a.m. I'm reading this, uh, this book, and then it says, my parents were married in my mother's hometown of Northfield, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I just jumped out of bed, I put the book down, I said, I said, there is an evil spirit probably trying to drive me crazy. <laughs> I'm already crazy enough about John Dubé's story connecting to the US. So now if I'm learning that John Dubé's story is connected to my town, I mean, I just put the book down and my heart was beating. It was at 2 a.m., my wife who was a nurse was at work, I was alone in my bed, and so I just, I said, okay, let me put the book down first and get my composure, I come back to the book, maybe my eyes play a trick on me, I'll read it again. And if I find that it's there, then I'm gonna to start to believe it. So I take the book again, I start from the beginning of the page, I say, let me read through slowly. And then it says, yes, my parents were married in my mother's hometown of Northfield, Minnesota. 
my God, I did not sleep that night. I was pacing my house the whole night. I was waiting for day to break so I could go to the library or at least talk to the congregational church because he started as a congregationalist but ended as a Baptist. You notice that, you know, because he, he quarreled with the congregationalist and only a Baptist church of all churches in Pasadena was able to give him some money. Anyway, so I, I, the next day I started, I said, I have to locally, I have to do research and then went to the library and in the Rice County Journal of 1881, their wedding was described, mm -hmm. you know. And from then on, uh, for a number of years, uh, I could get her correspondence with her mother, Mrs. Wilcox's correspondence with her mother. She would write from Inanda, from Ifafa, from Untualume, places that I visited later. She would write from there, and she would send those letters to her mother. The mother would read them, and then give them to the local newspaper, and they'd publish them. Anyway, so the family was ashamed of them. Okay, the family was so ashamed that, you know, they were sitting on that pain. So I decided that I needed to do a film. And as part of that film was taking the descendants, you know, the grandson to South Africa where he was given a hero's welcome. He told me, you know, Sheriff, you are the one who made me know my grandparents. When an old man tells you that, it means that you've made a difference. He was the same age, same age as Mandela. They died, in fact, one month apart. Okay, so, so and, and some family members could not believe that this was happening, that this recognition was really happening till the, night, the, the, the week when they received an invitation from the South African Consulate General in Los Angeles that they were invited to a dinner at the Intercontinental Hotel, that the delegation had come. They had not wanted, and they had stayed away from me. Because they say, we don't know why this guy is poking his nose. And it's no good. So, and believe me, these people, and the night, the night before the ceremony, the president's office woke me up at night. Uh, I was in the side and say, Professor Keta, give us your, your email address. So it was the, 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 the recognition letter that the president had decided that was being sent to me in the email and sent also to, to uh, Zwilim Kize. Zwilim Kize, who is now the Minister of Health of South Africa. He went through different positions. When I first met him in 2006, this is the interesting thing that happened. I was introduced to him. And I was on my way to Cornfields and Tabalithle in the Midlands. So we stopped by Peter Marisburg. That's where his office was. He was at that time uh, MEC for Economic Affairs. So we talked. I explained this story to him. He was so blown away by this story. He told me, he told me, I said, Professor Keta, are you sure you are not a Sangoma? <laughs> a Sangoma is a divine. I say, he said, are you sure you are not a Sangoma? I said, no, I'm not a Sangoma. I said, this story is very strange. And then he told me, okay, look, now, what do you want us to do when you are done with this research? I told him, what I want you to do when I'm done with this research, I want South Africa to send a delegation to California to pay your respect to these people because they died at a time when nobody knew that South Africa was going to be something other than the white man's country. And in fact, Wilcox had predicted that in one of his exchange with John Dubey. He told him, you know, John, South Africa is still going to be a white man's country when long after you and I have passed on. So I said, I want you to send a delegation to to, to, to pay your respect. So then uh, Zuma comes to power, and then uh, as president, then he becomes the premier, the governor of KwaZulu Natal. And one day I'm sitting in my office, his office, I get a phone call, Professor Keita, this is so and so, uh, prepare our visit, we are coming to, 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 to the United States to do what we promised to do. I said, my God, how can I do this now? I mean, and they have not even, even contacted the, the embassy in Washington. They have not com, com, uh, contacted the consulate general. So I was the one, I said, my God, I'm just a professor. Now I have to prepare the coming of a delegation, a Salafran delegation for this. Anyway, so I worked with the delegation, with the uh, different diplomatic representation. So they were excited because they had no idea about this story. So we prepared, as you can see, a grand style at the end, you know, so to go pay respect. So, and some of these family members who had not believed this, they were inconsolable at the, at, at the, at the, you know, at the Forest Lawn Cemetery. And so again, that's uh, a, a, the gist of the story I wanted to share with you. So a story that started so remotely from me, uh, out there, thousands of miles, from my own field in Francophone studies. I had no idea, see what I mean? So, and then, you know, I tell people that the story found me. I didn't find the stories. 
the stories found me. You know, I say it all goes back to the day when Jamie, you and I were standing in front of John Dubé's encamped grave at his school, dilapidated grave. And I was standing there with a, a little old camera uh, for home movies that I was standing and filming him. I said that that's when John Dubé saw me. I said, this is a man who is a connecting link in my scattered story, a story scattered between America and South Africa, that I was a, a link. And I, I, it took me years to figure it out as I was going. Every year I see something. And to the point where in 2007, before the family came to visit me, I told myself, you know, I better go look for the family's graves now. Something I've never done before. I said, I better go look for them. And I did research and found out the parents of Ida Bell were buried in a cemetery. Where was the cemetery? The cemetery was 100 meters behind my bedroom. <laughs> a cemetery, they were buried 100 meters in a cemetery that I had never wanted to visit. My kids used to go play there, but I never, I stayed away from it. And then it tells me now, this is where the Clary family is buried. Not even a hundred meters behind my, my bedroom. I say, these are the spirits. So you were the, from Sangoma. Well, well, I mean, this is the, you see, I wonder at that point, I wonder at that point, I say, what is happening to me, see? That's when I realized that, you know, those were the, the spirits that were not appeased, unappeased spirits, who first sent me to South Africa with you. Because I was the only African in the neighborhood. <laughs> Send me on a mission. Thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, you know, if you have questions, you, yeah. I think we have some time. Yes. Thank you very much, Sharif, for yes. sharing the story. And um, yes. for those who don't know, this is part of a trilogy of films about Inanda Seminary and John Duve. And the whole thing is a, is a major undertaking. So we've seen one piece of it here. Uh, so now we have an opportunity for questions. And, uh, and I should thank David for having been a cheerleader for me from the very beginning. And who, I think, uh, may have ordered uh, 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 my film when it was still on video cassette or something, my film of John Ruby, and I've even talked to the other people about this, this work that this Sharif Keta is doing. So thanks for really being a support and an encouragement for me. So uh, it gives me pleasure to be able to thank you publicly for your support. And I think now the library owns a trilogy on DVD. So the technology has uh, improved. And in the meantime, we've had different versions that we you know, improved. So I was still learning. I didn't know what I was doing. So, but anyway, so thanks for, for having helped me along the way. Thank you, yes. So time for questions. And uh, just remembering that the microphone doesn't amplify your voice. It okay. just makes sure that oh, for the recording is heard on okay. the live stream. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Um, that's, please do use the microphone. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. I mean, to call this uh, an, an amazing and um, fantastic story is uh, a colossal understatement. It's, it's <laughs> just, uh, it just Thank speaks you. to so many issues. Thank you. And um, it's a historical record that is you yes. know, exceptional. Thank you. And uh, also it touches on um, very important themes in, mm -hmm. in, in researching and talking about African liberation. That's right. Um, as you rightly pointed out, the story of the Wilcoxes is, right. is, is an aberration from the yeah. tra traditional sense in which people understand missionaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful story of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, That's it, right. The human element in the story is just so powerful. Thank you. Thank and, you. And I think this is, this is really great. Thank so, you. Um, my question is not really in that line, it's mm -hmm. to do with um, mm -hmm. the um, movement, mm -hmm. or the independent church movement That's right, yes. in, in, in Southern Africa during yep. this period, yep. the late yep. 19th century, very flourishing. Yes. How, how did Wilcox interact with those? Wilcox was part yes. of that movement. In fact, he was an advocate for that, you see. Yes. He was, because he didn't believe that a church that is a real church should be relying on handouts from outside. If people really believed, if they really believed, mm -hmm. then they will support themselves. Right. In fact, it's one of those ideas he even put into John Dubé's mind. Because when John Dubé as a young boy was given to him, 30 gold sovereigns was nothing for educating a young man. It was in fact enough to just pay for the boat. When they got here, there was nothing left for educating John Dubé. So that's an interesting story. So before he, John, uh, John, uh, Wilcox accepted the, 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 the boy, he told the mother, he said, okay, now, I am willing to take him, but I want him to pledge, and you to pledge that, 
is not going to rely on any handouts for making it in America because if it's willing to work like I did to be able to be what I am today and not rely on people, then I will take him. But if he thinks that somebody's going to just pay his way and support him, he won't. So the spirit of independence again. Now, what he did when he got here, he had no money. So he decided to uh, apply uh, at the Hampton Institute. The Hampton Institute was where Booker T. Washington himself was educated. So General Armstrong, who was the head of the Hampton Institute, was a, a liberal white man. So he had accepted to give a scholarship to John Dubey. So now he takes John Dubey there. They go there. And John Dubey, 16 year old, he looks around. But all he sees are black people. And also, I think native, some Native Americans too, of very dark skin. Okay. So it turns to Wilcox. He says, it's not to think about his mother. His mother said, go to America, take him to America so he can get education white boys get. Then this 16 year old boy realizes suddenly that this is not education for white boys, this is segregated education, just like in South Africa. He turns around and tells uh, uh, Baba, he says, uh, father, can I go to the school where you went, which was Oberlin College? Wilcox says, okay, good. If you want, I'm going to take you there. But again, you will have to work and study just like I did to pay for yourself. Again, the spirit of self-sustaining, you see. You know, so Wilcox was his mindset. And that's the spirit he put in Dubé. He put in all the people that came around him self-supporting, but also self-determining. And that's why he's able to stand up to the government, say, if you tax them, give them representation. And that tells you again, the Wilcox was almost like a, an American patriot, you know, who went to that. He was both an abolitionist in the tradition of the Underground Railroad, but he was also this patriot, American, with no taxation without representation. So those are some of the ideas he took there, you see and he injected in his, in his mission work. Oh, I mean, he had conflict with other missionaries. In fact, he said, he said missionaries. He didn't consider himself, you see, because his belief was economic independence. You see? And uh, he's part of that. And, and that's why, I mean, the Congregational Church, when they discovered my work on this man, they say, you know, we need to celebrate this man. Because if we are what we are today, I mean, it's because of this man. I mean, the ramifications are just incredible. I mean, I work with the churches there, local church, I mean, church, I worked with the cemetery service, you know, because my third uh, project in the trilogy was uh, looking for John Dubé's uh, uh, forgotten wife who had been erased from history. And that's a, not a tragic story. Nokutela's story is the story of the marginalization, marginalization of women. And their story is tragic. And uh, it involved uh, literally working for a year and a half with the, with the cemetery service to find her grave with the metal detectors and so forth. In, in the Brixton Cemetery, one of the earliest cemeteries of, of, of South Africa, in Johannesburg, to, to be able to pinpoint her grave. I mean, it's just, so now today she's being celebrated also as one of the women leaders of the church. You see, one of the women leaders who sustained the church uh, with her artistic talent, with her philanthropic, with her philanthropy, with, with her, I mean, just incredible. Anyway, so, you know, that's, that's the thing. So the independent churches, Wilcox is right there. And they're beginning to celebrate him. Yeah. Yes, Ken, Hi. how are you? <laughs> wonderful. Oh, thank you. Wonderful story. I, I have two questions, kind of, kind of vague questions. Yes, yes. Um, Wilcox is, in your presentation, I, yes. I, I, I have this picture of Wilcox That's right. working as a kind of soul yes. um, light on his own. Yes. But it, at the time of the founding, I mean, mm -hmm. there was the Communist Party, there were, uh, AMC had collaboration across many different collaboratives. So yes. I was wondering about... That came much later. That came later? Oh, much later. There was no Communist Party around that time. Well, I was thinking yes. of the, uh, towards the end of his stay, was, he yes. said he was expelled in, in 1918. 1917, he left and the wife joined 1918. Yeah. Okay, now, 1917, yes, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So that was part of, was he totally on his own? Oh, and the, my second question. Pretty much, yes, okay, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. the second question yes. was, you kind of answered it, which was, yeah. he comes back to the U.S. Yes, yes. In 1917. That's right. And then he's, he's, he's got this youth that he wants. That's a time of really heightened increasing racism actually in the u.s and i was curious about 
but what was that like those 10 years before he died? What was it like, L.A., with, I mean, the whole yes. situation, the racial situation in the States? I was yes. curious how that played out in this story. Okay, very good. Wilcox was pretty much alone, but he was working also with the Colenso family. In fact, I found a letter. The Colenso had, uh, they were working in the same area in Natal, in the Midlands. So, in fact, I have a correspondence between Wilcox and Harriet Colenso, the bishop's uh, daughter, uh, saying that he has started this community, you know, in the, the Midlands, those two towns, uh, he had put, in, put up a school and a church, one of the kind of things he was doing that was similar to what Colenso had done. So in that sense, he was not alone, but he was the one doing it on the American side. That's why this uh, Daryl Balia is calling him the American Colenso. More, needs, more work needs to be done in that area. Okay, now, uh, again, when Wilcox came back, Wilcox was, believe me, at the age of 50, he was uh, in the 60s when he came back. First of all, he was so destitute, as I say, he had to work in an assembly line in Detroit. In fact, he came because he had a brother living in Michigan. He, while he was waiting for his wife, he went to work in an assembly line because he had no pension. He had spent all his little money he had as a missionary. He had put it on the Zulu Industrial Improvement Company. So when he was broke, he came back, he had nothing. So he worked, okay. So he was, as I say, working on odd jobs. What, what first, and he was still hoping that he would be able to go back and continue the fight. But nobody wanted to subscribe. No, nobody wanted to, 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 to take him, give him money so he could go back. So he died like that. But what frustrated him more was the ignorance about Africa. He, he tells the story of uh, when he first was sent back, uh, terminated by the, uh, the American Zulu Mission and the American board. He worked in King Valley, King Valley, New York. It's in the Adirondacks, a small town there. That was the first post he was a pastor of that congregational church. And that's when John Dubey, as a young boy, spent some time with him in King Valley. In fact, part of my research, I went to King Valley, mm -hmm. and the congregational church is there and everything. So anyway, so, so he said that in New York, when he said Africa or Zulu country, some people said, oh, is it somewhere out west? Oh. People were so ignorant, <laughs> believe me, of, 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 of Africa. And that's where his heart was. You see? So he died really as a sad man because, as I say, his family, his family didn't even appreciate what he had done because he had nothing to show for, for what he had done. 38 years or more, he had nothing to show for. You see, South Africa was still a white man's country. South Africa was becoming more and more a white man's country. And he, as you can see what John Dewey said, this was a man who stood alone because of what he believed in and suffered ridicule. John Dewey said it. You see? So, see, this is the thing. So, so, really, I can imagine the last years of his life. I mean, he was trying to write, he wrote this book, uh, 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 The Man from an, Africa, from an African Jungle, okay? So, I think uh, the title was probably the editor, the publisher probably chose a jazzy title, okay? Anyway, what, what he was talking about really was his commitment to empowering, economic empowerment, self sustaining missions, you see? And that's where he started experimenting. You see, so so he, he really, uh, I guess uh, he, he was aware, I'm sure, of the racial thing. And in fact, I heard so a friend of mine told me that, you know, uh, there was a big migration of people from the south, you know, places like Oklahoma, and places like, to California. Right. The Dust Bowl and other things had forced many people to migrate there, and those people, many of them, were not of the best kind of mindset when it comes to diversity. So and also imagine Wilcox living with some of these people. You know, so I can understand, you know. Yeah, so more research needs to be done. Because. You see, exactly. So uh, that's quite interesting. I mean, very frustrating. Very, very frustrating, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, yeah, and, and in fact, his wife, when he left his wife, I mean, the wife taught uh, uh, in Bulwer. Bulwer is, uh, is uh, uh, near Petersburg, Peter Marysburg, and she taught in a school there. In fact, that particular uh, uh, town, of uh, Mwadi, I, I never can say the, the click, it's N-C-W-A-D. Okay, oh, thanks, I mean, that's something I need to still work on. Maybe you can help me read before I left, okay? Anyway, so that small town, this is where, in fact, before Otlangi, before Otlangi, Otlangi, the Tuskegee of South Africa, before Otlangi, John Dube and his wife, in 1894, when they were married, this is where they built their first school with their own resources, okay? 
Okay, the system is calling us. Okay. Yes, okay. So maybe the ancestors are telling me it's time to stop. <laughs> you know, come at the end of a uh, year. <laughs> so, okay, if it's not, uh, reassure me. Okay. Anyway, so you see, so, so in that town, that's, that's where, with their own means, and they didn't go, they had not gone to America yet to fundraise for that other school. You see, they were able, with their own resources, to go build a school there. In what? Okay, this school is still there. In fact, we are working now to to make the school a heritage, a national heritage site. That's something we are working on right now. The school is there. So they built it, John and, and, and Nukutela, with the help of Nukutela's brother John Dima, who took care of the school when they left to come back to continue their studies. So they invested, the wife's family, Nukutela's family, invested in the school, in that town. And it was the first school of the town. It's still there. So we are working on the school now to see how we can revitalize it because the school is in, part of it is in terrible condition. That's the part that John Dube built. You know, later the government built some other classes, but the historic part is still there. So that's the part we are kind of, you know, working on. So uh, there are a lot of ramifications to the story. It also, it's the heritage work that also we are doing, you know, to give the people a sense of their history through those places of memory. You know, that's what, something we are working on. You see? Yes. So it's a wonderful yes, story. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, for this. Okay, there thank are so you. many strands of the study traced mm -hmm. out, including uh, thank you. Nelson Mandela coming to the Oshlanda Institute uh, yes. to, cast, <laughs> to cast his vote for yes. the independence of right. uh, so South Africa. That's right, that's right. Uh, majority, yeah. majority rule in, yep. in honor of that. Yep. Uh, one yep. of the strands mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. um, you haven't told mm. the story in one as in one of your films about yeah, yeah. the work of his mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dubey's wife. Is it Nukutela? In Nukutela, Nukutela, yes. Right. That's the third uh, film. Helped to found the yes. Inanda Girls School. He, he, well, right. she was a student. No, she was a product of Inanda Seminary, okay. which was started in 1869. So she was, in fact, part of the first generation of students to graduate, and she later taught there. She became a teacher there, you see? So she graduated and later taught there. But again, in another seminary also is discovering Nogutela today. In fact, they are project presenting her, really, and I presented her as one of the first to build institutions. A woman to build institutions, to build Otlangi, to build Ilangala Senatal, to build the whole music, musical tradition that gave uh, uh, birth to the, the uh, Ngosi Sikilela in Africa, which was not composed by her, but she's the one who popularized the song that became the national anthem. Because she founded the first choir of the school. They used to go around to use this song to raise funds for the school. Because they were self-sustaining again, yes. you see? So, so they were telling people, listen, because that song, Ngosi Sikilela in Africa, in fact, translates philosophically the belief in independence that Africa has to stand on its own feet and reach God without the help of anybody. You see, so that's John and Nukutela when they met uh, uh, Enoch Santonga, who was a very unassuming, very shy man in a Methodist church, you see. So when they found, they, they heard this song, the first few lines, it translated their spirit of independence, you see what I mean? That's why they took it. In fact, it's very interesting. There is a whole story to that Nukutela. Uh, because John and Nukutela, and or the composer at the school, they composed verses to the song that said at some point, God bless the son of Dube as he crosses the seas to speak to the whites. We pray for him. These were some of the lyrics of Nkosi Sikilela in Africa before it became taken by the ANC. Because that song translated the school's ethos of an African institution standing on its own feet. And John used to always tell people in newspapers, if you want an institution that fights for you, support it. Philanthropy. You see? So that's, you see, that's very interesting. So anyway, so Nukutela was key in that. And besides that, Nukutela was a tailor. I tell people that Nukutela was the first designer in South Africa. Because she had learned uh, uh, sewing, by hand, with her hand, but in 1899, as she was going back, uh, after three, spending three years in Brooklyn, 
So a group of women who were certainly linked to the women's movement in, South, in the U.S. from uh, Seneca, from Seneca, oh, Seneca Falls, they bought a sewing machines for Nukotera to take back. A wonder she was taken back. So it is with that sewing machine that the whole tailoring program at Otlangi was based on. And some elders told me that this tailoring program developed so much that in his childhood, that the clothes that the students at Otlangi used to make in their school used to compete with the clothes imported and sold in Durban department stores. And that was Nukotela, you see. So, so yeah, in the, the, yeah. The time has not allowed. But this afternoon, I think this afternoon, with graduate students or you know whoever wants to come, I'm going to show a short uh, version, a 26, 27 minutes version of the Nukotela story, and talk about her. And there, one of your themes I know is the marginalization of women. That's right. But yes. One of the connections here is yeah. that one of the very first uh, students to come to from South Africa. Yes. Uh, after '94. Yes. To to do her graduate degree here. Yes was a woman named Nontlandla Jordan. She was uh, married to A.C. Jordan's uh, grandson. Oh, from, really? was a faculty member at University of the Transkei and at Fort Hare. She became the executive director uh, after leaving MSU with her graduate degree. Really? Of the National Council of South African Women. Of, uh, and one of the things she told us when she was here was that many of the women leaders yes. acted against the marginalization of women in South Africa were graduates of Ananda Seminary. The way. Uh, the way you are right. So, so there's a yes. Just, uh, yes, you are right. In fact, yeah. there was a time when uh, about uh, half of the women in the parliament in South Africa were graduates of another seminary, right. and even in the government. In fact, there was a time uh, in the Tabumbeki where two or three uh, ministers in the government had Inanda connections. You see, yeah. there was uh, uh, she was uh, uh, Toko Didiza. Toko Didiza was the graduate of Otlange, okay? Uh, there was um, the woman from uh, uh, the chief, the royal family, Sikau, Stella Sikau. Stella Sikau had been a teacher at Otlange. And then this woman who works now at the UN uh, for women's issues, Pum, that's why, right, was also a graduate of Otlange. And in fact, Pumzele's uncle is the one who brought back John Dube's name within the school. Esting Lobo is the one who brought John Dube's uh, uh, name and model. So uh, at the time when Otlange was run down, at the time when my first film talks about uh, uh, Pumzile's uncle, he's working using the model of Dube to give pride to the students of Otlange so they could withstand apartheid and become leaders. You see? So yeah, you see, there is quite a connection there. Yeah, in under, and yes. A uh, brief question though. Yes, yes. I'm puzzled why did the American board yes. uh, uh, criticized Wilcox because the churches of the American board have been part of the Underground Railroad in this, in this country. Yes. And uh, yes, the that's... Congregational American Board churches in yes. Rhodesia yes. were known for their resisting the white settlers and, yes. uh, by later and for resisting the colonials at the, yes. at the American board mission station in yeah. uh, Angola. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Well, the question is why? Mm -hmm. Why did they come at it? it yeah, just it conflict with the local missionaries. Yeah, it shows the power. It shows the power of the state to impose this line to people, and the, the church had to collaborate with them and work maybe underground. But Wilcox was the extreme point of that, of challenging. You see, not settling for it. You see, in fact, the, the American board terminated Wilcox because he was so close to he and his wife. In fact, uh, there's this woman, Katie Makanya. Katie Makanya, for those who know the story of nursing mm -hmm. in South Africa, okay? Katie Makanya was the first assistant of uh, uh, Dr. McCord. Dr. McCord uh, built this hospital in Durban and the first school for black uh, African nurses, okay? They started together with Katie Makanya. Katie said that she remembered meeting Mrs. Wilcox. And it's, I'm going to analyze this because it's very interesting that she mentions, among, she doesn't mention meeting a lot of white women, but she says, I even met with Mrs. Wilcox. Because Wilcox and his wife, they were so much part of the black community. Apparently, they say, they used to go preach together everywhere, see? So they became very known, very well known. So again, the answer to your question is that the, the, the South African state 
managed to impose certain lines. Because, I mean, literally they gave the mission reserves to the government to tax them, which was something they're not supposed to do. That's why Wilcox said, uh, give me an assignment somewhere where I don't have to give communion to people who have wronged, he said. So I don't want to be part of, oh, he says that. The embarrassment of the land question, he says, because I don't want to give them communion when we have wronged them. He was a radical man. Oh, yes, he was. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Sharif, for being here. And thanks to everyone for coming and for your great questions. Um, I want to let you, you know much. that um, you. next week our Eye on Africa speaker is also going to be talking about South Africa. We're very happy to have Mosa Padi coming here. She's going to be talking about multiple consciousness of blackness, uh -huh. race, and class in South Africa, looking at the... The, the multiple consciousness that, that mm -hmm. black South Africans are, are facing. Interesting. Um, and she's part of our Ubuntu Dialogues, Mellon funded Ubuntu Dialogues project. And yes. um, I encourage everyone to come. She's coming directly from Stellenbosch. She'll just be here for that week. So oh. it's a really great opportunity um, to hear from Musa. Yes. So thank you all very much for coming. And thank, thank you, you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much.